the main theological argument of the book of Hebrews. We come to a period of exhortation and application. Um, So we're going to read um, from verse 19. And Kevin, you've just got a visitor. Would you mind just going to say hello? Hello. Hello. Welcome. You're very welcome to come in and join us if you'd like. Yeah. You just have a seat somewhere at the back, maybe anywhere. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to read from verse 19. But just before I read God's word, I'm going to pray for us. O oh Lord our God, uh, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And so we pray that you would feed us and nourish our souls as we come to your word. Guard us from error. Call us to repent of our sin and draw us nearer to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. So we um, began our service um, reading from the book of Genesis, and it's not the first time that we've read from that portion of those earlier chapters of the book. The reason that we did that, and that we do it so often, is that uh, Genesis is foundational to understanding of the rest of Scripture. And the bit that we read, we see that sin uh, separated man from God. As a result of sin, Adam was driven out, from the Garden of Eden. As a result of sin, Adam's family spiraled into chaos. Cain murdered Abel. And as a result of sin, Cain was driven further east of Eden, further from the presence of God. Sin separates from God, but we're also, in Genesis given, a very solid example of how good life with God can be. Because before Adam was driven out from the Garden of Eden, We have the account in the Garden of Eden. And what was that life like? It was a life of fruitfulness. It was a life of bounty, a life of abundance, a life of communion with God, a life free from suffering and pain and distress of every kind, a life filled with peace and love and joy. And the design of having that portion of God's word and reflecting on it briefly now is that our hearts would long to again be near to God, to be in the presence of God. And the book of Hebrews, you see, is all about how it is that Jesus Christ has brought us again into the presence of God. And that's what we've just concluded all the way through the first 10 chapters, how Jesus is the high priest who has offered his life to make atonement for sin and who makes intercession for us and who, through faith and union with Christ, we are brought into the presence of God again. And all that remains for us now, as he moves to a period of application, is 
to draw near to God through Jesus Christ. And so that's what the sermon's about this morning, drawing near to God. And we'll consider it with three points. The first point is this, draw near to God because every barrier has been removed. Draw near to God because every barrier has been uh, removed. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. He refers here to the tabernacle, which is a picture of the heavenly realities as we've considered. As the high priest would go into the holiest of holiest, where God would meet once a year, he encourages us to go not into the tabernacle, but into the very presence of God. Now, if you know the scriptures, you know that in one sense, that's absolutely crazy. There are flaming swords that guard the way to the tree of life. For the people of God, were they to touch the base of Mount Sinai where God appeared, they would be stoned or shot with an arrow. Nadab and Abihu tried to approach God in some inappropriate manner, and they were consumed with fire. Uzzah, when he sought to stabilize the Ark of the Covenant, when the ox stumbled, was struck dead by God for approaching God. We can't just come to God as we are because we are sinful. We join our voices to the people at Mount Sinai and we say this, if God only should speak to us, we would die. Everything that we know about God and about ourselves makes it impossible for us to draw near to God. God is holy and righteous and pure and we are unholy, we are unrighteous and we are impure. And yet he says that we with boldness can go into the holiest. With boldness you can approach God. How? Because, as he says, we come by the blood of Jesus. And this is what the whole book has been about, that the consequences for our sin and our transgression fell upon Jesus Christ. As he says in verse 12, this man, had off, uh, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. We can come boldly into the presence of God, not by ourselves, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus, we're not unclothed and exposed and ashamed as Adam and Eve were in the garden, but we are clothed. We come by the blood of Jesus, but we also come through Jesus, verse 20. We come by a new and a living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Jesus is the fulfillment of the new covenant. And we come now through him. As the high priest represented the people, was chosen from amongst the people, and would go into the presence of God for the people. So we now come into the presence of God through Jesus Christ, the living way. We don't go through the veil of the temple, because Jesus Christ has passed through the veil of the heavens and he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And now we, through faith, partake in his sacrifice and we are cleansed of our sin. But through faith, we are also bound to him. We are united to him. We are married to him as a husband is to the wife. And because we are in him, we can approach God and we are not struck dead. Though you might try to approach Mount Sinai 10,000 times, every time you'd be struck dead. But coming to Mount Zion, on which the king of the new covenant reigns, you will never be struck dead. Because he suffered that death for you. The 10,000, the 10 million deaths that you would suffer approaching God, he suffered for you on account of your sin. And when the Father looks upon you as you come through Jesus, who is the new and living way, the Father doesn't see you as you are. He sees you in his own beloved Son. He sees you in one who is clothed in the beauty of Christ, in the obedience of Christ, in the praise of Christ. And so though you may, though you may feel afraid to come to God because you are a sinner, in Jesus Christ, you can come. The impediment of sin is removed by Christ.
Bye bye. Sin keeps us from God, but we can come by the blood and through Jesus Christ, the new and living way. And then it's also a struggle for us to come to God. We feel unworthy to approach God because this world is all around us with its temptations and its pleasures and its pains. We are more enamored with the things around us than we are with God, and so we're distracted from coming to God. Moreover, we don't choose to come to God because we choose to invest our time in the things of this world and the priorities of this world. And our faith is weak. And when we go after the things of this world, we feel that it would be hypocritical to approach God. But he also has an answer to that because he tells us in verse 21 that we have a high priest over the house of God. Our Savior is not unlike us, but our Savior has a body just like ours. And he lived and walked the life of faith before us. He knows how to endure trials and temptations. And he is the priest in the heavens now able to supply the help that you need so that you don't shrink back. Moreover, he was with his disciples. He saw the failure of faith in the disciples around him. He saw in his disciples firsthand their wrestling with sin. And so he sees your failure with faith and he sees your wrestling with sin. But he is there for you at the right hand. And he promises to supply mercy and grace to you to help. So that you, like the father of the demon-possessed child who cried out to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, can cry out to Jesus Christ, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. My heart is cold. I am struggling, and I have struggled. But he knows it. And if you just lift up your voice in prayer, he promises with understanding to give you what you need, that you might come to him. Remember when the apostle Peter asked to get out of the boat to walk on the water as Jesus had done? And his faith failed and he began to sink, but Jesus reached down and he grabbed him by the hands. He does the same for us. When we are struggling and we are sinking and we don't feel we can draw near to God, we have this faithful and merciful high priest. And the moment we look to him in faith, he reaches down and he takes our hand and he raises us up to his presence. The sin that stands before you and God is taken away. The struggle and the unworthiness you feel is in a sense made irrelevant because you have a high priest who is merciful and gracious, who is like you. And then there are the doubts. Does this really apply to me? Am I really a Christian? Does the Father love me? But he even has a remedy for this. He says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Not only does God declare to you that the sin is removed, that you have a faithful and merciful high priest, but he gives to you a concrete sign. He says here to the believing community, your bodies have been washed with water. You were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so you might not feel that you have any right to come to God. You might not feel that you have any right to claim the name of Jesus Christ, but your baptism says otherwise. As the blood of the covenant at Mount Sinai was sprinkled on the people and they saw it and they felt it and they knew that they were consecrated to God. So in your baptism, God has sprinkled the waters of baptism upon you. And as you felt them, or at least as you can remember back and you can ask your parents about them, in that act, God declares to you that he will be your God and that he will cleanse you of your sin. And that he will be merciful to you and faithful all of your days. And he will bring you into his presence. And all you need to do, like the people of the old covenant, is believe in it. Are you concerned that God has no interest in you? By that baptism, he has signed 
and he has sealed his interest in you. Each one of you, when you were baptized, God declared, I will be your God. Believe in me. There is no reason to doubt. The barrier of sin is removed. The struggle and the weakness we feel, there is an answer for it. And the doubts are removed through our baptism. You say that you can't draw near to God, but the Holy Spirit says, to the contrary, you can. You can come with boldness before God. You can draw near to God, verse 22, with uh, true hearts in full assurance of faith. You can have absolute confidence. You can come into the presence of God. The God of Eden who made this world, who filled it with his beautiful and glorious character, is now your God through Jesus Christ. And by faith, you are transported into his presence. When you lift up your voice in prayer and song, and when you meditate on his word, and when you come to his table, by faith, you are in the presence of God. And you might not see it, and you might not feel it, but you will be blessed having come into the presence of God. All of the barriers that stand in your way have been removed in Jesus Christ, and so draw near to God. Secondly, draw near to God in faithfulness. He says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And you might ask, how does this relate to drawing near to God? And it does in two ways. Firstly, it relates in this respect that we have not arrived yet. We commune with God now, but we don't see him face to face as we will when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We commune with him now by faith and not by sight. That is, our communion with God is not one of a sensual experience. It's not the feeling of God. It's trust in the word of God. And through that trust in God's promises, we have a communion with God in the Holy Spirit. But until we get to that place where we come into the full experience of our relationship with God, we have a long walk ahead of us. And that walk is unpredictable, and at times it is dark. And so we struggle. It's a bit like the difference between being gifted a tropical island and having the deed or the paperwork, but not actually being there. You imagine if you saved up all of your pennies, children, and you bought yourself some amazing island, and you had the paperwork, but you hadn't yet visited it. The island is yours. You have a life with God. You commune with God by faith, but you've not yet been there. You're not lying on the beach. You're not digging holes for treasure. You're not cooking fish over the volcano. It's the same in our walk with God. We have communion with God. We've been brought into life with God. We can draw near to God by faith, but we have not yet arrived at the full experience of that because Christ has not come back and your bodies have not been glorified and you do not yet see Jesus Christ. And because of this, we can doubt and we can drift. And so he encourages us. He says, hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering. Hold on to the gospel. Continue to follow after Christ. Why? For he who promised is faithful. When we're not sure, when we don't feel the certainty of faith, because we are not there in his presence, we need to remember this, that God who has promised is faithful. And it takes us back to an argument he made in chapter 6. Remember he said that God had made a promise and an oath to Abraham, and in the same way he made a promise and oath that we would have a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And the design of that was that his hearers and we today would recognize that it is God had said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will give you so many descendants that you can't count that we would see it. Because when he wrote, Abraham had all of these descendants. He had all of these children, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. As God had promised to Abraham, in your seed, the nations of the earth would be blessed the people then saw it, and we see it. Nations have come into the church of Jesus Christ just as God said they would. And as certain as we are of that, 
then we can be just as certain that we have a high priest in the heavens who intercedes for us and who supplies everything that we need. He says, have faith. God's promises have never failed. You might not feel the relationship with God. And you might believe that that relationship with God is not there. But have faith, because God's word declares that just as Abraham had had loads of kids, and he did, you have a high priest in the heavens now. You can't see him, but he is there, and he cares for you, and he is interceding for you, and he has provided atonement for you. And no matter how long it takes, you will see him. He's already said in chapter 9 and verse 28 that he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. He's coming back. And that's something you don't want to miss out on. Because however good the relationship with God is now, and it is, it will be indescribably good when Jesus Christ comes back. And so you don't want to give up. Though you walk by faith and not by sight, and though you might not have all of the evidences and the proofs and the full experience that you need, trust in God's word. Don't give up. The high priest is there, and he's coming back for you. Continue to believe. There's a second way that faithfulness relates to drawing near to God, and it's this. that The vertical, that is the relationship with the Father through the Son, is maintained through the horizontal, through a following after the Son. So think about all of the warnings that we've had in this book so far. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. Chapter 3 and verse 13. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sins. Why does he warn us? Is he trying to say that there's something doubtful about our salvation? That there's something uncertain? It's not. The reason that he warns us is because salvation is not an event. Salvation is a person. Salvation is not something that happened to you at one point in time. Salvation is something that you have through a living relationship with Jesus Christ. He is, after all, verse 20, the new and the living way. The only way you're going to the Father is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's absolutely vital that as we think about drawing near to God in the ways that we did in the first point, through our corporate worship, through our meditation on the word, through prayer and song, that absolutely key to drawing near to God is continuing to walk after Jesus, looking forward to the author and finisher of our faith, following after him, being like him, loving him every day of our lives. That's the key to drawing near to God. If you think it's about something that happened to you once in time, you're in the risk category of one who drifts away and one who never enters into the full experience of salvation. Yes, Jesus Christ accomplished redemption at one point in time through his death and resurrection, but you participate in his salvation through a living relationship. And so you draw near to God, not just in church, not just in your homes and private acts of worship and family worship, but essential to your drawing near to God is every single day walking after Jesus, following him, obeying him doing all that he has asked you to do in faith. It is in the horizontal that the vertical is maintained. And so draw near to God. Every barrier has been removed. Draw near to God in faithfulness. And then thirdly, draw near to God, and this one's a um, little surprising, through loving one another. He says in verse 24, and let us consider one another. Here's his third instruction to the church. Think about each other. Be mindful of one another. Love one another. Consider one another. And you think, well, what's that got to do with drawing near to God? And he goes on to say, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. 
In other words, your considering of one another is an instrument of your spiritual health. You, as the people of God, are used for the increase of love to Christ in one another and for the increase of the fruits of righteousness in one another. That's what he says. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good deeds. You're even used for one another in the preserving of your souls until the day of judgment. At the end of verse 25, exhort one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. If you want to have a healthy relationship with God, you want to draw near to God, this will only happen through your love, through your consideration of one another. And how does this happen? Well, number one, we come together to create a context for our corporate communion and worship where the means of grace are administered. It is in the assembly of God's people that God speaks to his people. It's through the gathering around the Lord's table that he communicates grace to his people. It's in the gathering of God's people that others are brought into the covenant of grace through the application of baptism. And so through your love to each other, through your assembling together, you create that environment where God's grace is poured out into your hearts, and you're all a part of that. If there's no assembly, there's no gathering together, then there is no corporate worship. And yet God has his priority here. But there's a second way, and it's this, that our presence in worship and fellowship is used to stir up love and good deeds, to make us healthy, to help us to continue to draw near to God. And he uses a very strong word here. He uses the word provoke. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. It's used when Paul and Barnabas have that sharp dispute. And he says, your job is to provoke one another in love and good deeds. Now, he doesn't mean that you should be abrasive with one another. What he means is that your attendance, your example, and your love compels, convicts, and challenges your brothers and sisters. You do this by your presence, and you are provoked by the presence of others. So think about your growth for a moment as Christians. How was your hunger for the word of God stirred up? Was it not through interacting with other brothers and sisters who had a deeper understanding of the word? You were around them. You heard their conversation. You heard the way they had an almost encyclopedic knowledge of the scriptures, and you thought, I want that too. That's the benefit of being around brothers and sisters. How was it that your character matured as a Christian? Was it not that you were exposed through the godliness of other brothers and sisters? that you were around them and you were ashamed when you heard of the grace in their speech and of the love in their hearts, when you saw the self-control that you lacked, when you heard through their words and saw through the deeds the dignity they bestowed on other believers and sisters. Was it not being around mature Christians that you were provoked to pursue maturity And to ask God that he might forgive you and that he might help you to grow. Was it not being around brothers and sisters that you were inspired to put your hand to the plow? When you heard what others were doing for the kingdom of God, your spirits were provoked because you knew that you had not done half as much for the kingdom of God. And in fact, if you could do half as much as some of the brothers and sisters you meet, you would be a very happy Christian. You see, it's being around one another that you see the gospel lived out. And it's there that you're challenged to grow and to want to grow and to make improvements and to see all of the ways that you lack. If you go through life independent, there's nobody to ever bring about that conviction of sin because you have blind spots. And when you stay by yourself, you continue to have the same blind spots. It's only when you're in the assembly and the gathering and the fellowship of God's people that you see all of the ways that your brothers and sisters excel 
in the spiritual graces and that you desire to be like them? Was your joy in worship not increased through the eager and exuberant hearts of your brothers and sisters? How hard it is to come out and to worship God each Lord's Day, but how much easier when you come into a fuller assembly and you see the way that other people eagerly come and other people lift up their voices and they're full of happiness to bless the Lord God. It helps you so much. We have grown through our physical gatherings and therefore through that growth and through the health that it produces in our lives, we draw near to God. And so we must love one another if we are to draw near to God. We must be committed to provoking one another in love and good deeds if we are to draw near to God. And what's the most loving thing that you can do then? How is this to be accomplished? He tells us in verse 25, by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. If it is loving to provoke one another to love and good deeds, because through these means we together draw near to God, then it is fundamentally unloving to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. It is in our gathering, in our community, that we grow by God's design, by Christ's organization, by the unity that the Spirit has brought into our lives. And so why do we neglect it? Why do we forsake the assembling of ourselves together? Well, sadly, it's nothing new. He says, do not neglect it, as is the manner of some. There have always been those who neglect the worship and the gathering of the saints. But here's a really tragic fact. Why did Christians neglect worship in the early church? And you might be tempted to say, well, it was because of the great persecution they were under. And that's partly true. And it puts us to shame. You might be tempted to say, well, it's because they expected the imminent return of Jesus Christ and the delay in his coming discouraged them. And that's partly true. But do you know what we discover? That in the second century, many Christians neglected the gathering of themselves together because of a preoccupation with business affairs. They were too busy for God. They were too busy for one another. And in the end, this amounts to selfishness. And nothing has changed. I know there are good reasons why some of us miss meetings. Due to ill health. Due to necessities of work. For some people, they stay away from the assembly of God's people because of deep-rooted hurt that's been done to them by other Christians. But if we're honest with ourselves, the number one reason why we miss the meetings of the church and have done all of our lives is because we are self-interested rather than interested in Christ and his body. Do you see what he's saying here? You need one another, and everybody else here needs you. Through your presence, through your assembling together, you provoke one another to a deeper love of Christ and to an abounding in the fruits of righteousness. And it is in that deepening love of Christ that you draw near to God. And so today I want to challenge you to resolve to change. Resolve today to love Christ and to love each other. And so resolve to gather together whenever you can, so much as there aren't other necessary things that must keep you away. Resolve to gather and in this show love to each other and enable one another, help one another to continue to enjoy the bounty that Christ has provided for us through his redemption in drawing near to God. And so we draw near to God. Every barrier has been removed. We draw near to God in faithfulness 
and we draw near to God through loving one another. And one step, one very clear step that we can take in that direction is church membership. We are called to faithfulness, to commitment, and to love. And that happens within a local body. Church membership, though it's done in different ways by other churches, is about making formal that commitment that we have to each other. It's about making ourselves accountable. To neglect church membership is the equivalent of choosing to cohabit rather than to marry. It's wanting the blessings of a relationship without the commitment. But it gets something very wrong because the blessing of a relationship is found in the commitment. The blessing of a marriage is found in the commitment that you make to each other. And your blessing will so much more be increased if you make that commitment to each other so much as you can whilst you're here in this local congregation. So we're going to now turn to um, membership.